My name is Jeff White. I was the digital production supervisor on Transformers, and um, I'm going to walk you through some of the stuff that we did, and uh, feel free to come put, uh, with any questions afterwards. I'll, I'll be happy to hang out for a while. So, um, hopefully lots of you are fans of the old cartoon. I know I, I was a huge fan. So, in terms of working out the animation, um, it was very interesting on the show because you think with 30 foot tall robots you'd want to really sell the weight and, and have them move pretty slow, but Michael didn't want that at all. He wanted uh, ninja alien warriors. He wanted to be full of energy, you know, throwing each other around. And, and actually, in hindsight, it was a great idea because it, it kept the movie full of action and that's his style. So, the animation supervisor, Scott Benza, really had a challenge in terms of working out, okay, how do I keep these things heavy while still making this exciting in, in a Michael Bay film? Uh, three, two, one, three. So for uh, the, a lot of the action three. scenes, we record video reference of the animation. And you can see that translated pretty directly into the shot. Here's another example. This is pretty funny. <laughs> So it was really nice for Michael to be able to go down and record these stunt uh, guys down in Los Angeles and then we'd bring that back up and use that as a, as a template for our animation. But we went and found video reference because we wanted each Transformer to have a unique way to transform sort of part of their character. So with a name like Jazz, it seemed appropriate that he would have a kind of dance move and you can see how much that references the video that we collected. This one was done by Sean Kelly. Additionally, we had to do a lot of work on facial animation. And um, we always, again, start with reference. And we tried to figure out how many pieces of the human face do we need to represent in the Autobot face in order for expressions to read. So we made eyebrows, uh, the, the eyes could dilate, the pupils could dilate, and of course the lips, which were so controversial. Michael was very insistent that he didn't care what people said, they were going to have the lips. There was a lot of controversy on the show about um, Optimus's lips, and um, we thought we'd bring along our first test that we did for this. <laughs> and I brought this shot along. This is from the AO sequence, and um, it, you know, it's a really beautiful shot. The lighting is incredible, but I also wanted to bring it because it really shows off the texture paint, uh, map painting that was done. There's over 34,000 texture maps uh, for all of the Transformers combined, and you can see that in the levels of paint. There's sort of the base color, then there's the car paint layer, there's a dirt layer, there's um, later his, all the glass gets cracked and broken. And a lot of the fine detail and etching is actually displacement that's in the shader rather than being modeled in. It's, it's pretty incredible. So here's the final Bumblebee model that we came up with, and um, it, it got quite complicated. By the time we were done, he just had thousands and thousands of pieces, and something that was very important to Michael is that you should be able to look at these models and recognize pieces that you would see if you lifted the hood of your car. Additionally, we had to do lots of levels of paint, so uh, we did a, a set of damage paint for Bumblebee, which you can see in his chest there uh, when he's having his battle with Demolisher um, in one of the sequences. Uh, he gets kind of scorched up. Um, so, and of course lots of weapons built. All, all of the rigs started with uh, our block party base, and that's a modular rigging system we have at ILM. And the rig is encoded in a geometric volume, so the first step is to re-sculpt that volume to fit your character, and this is what our volume looked like for Bumblebee. Then the joints are drawn off of that geometry, so we don't have to go in and place them by hand. It uses that mesh and draws the joints out for us. Um, so this was the base rigging, but then there were hundreds of hours of uh, building every piston, every flywheel, um, setting it all up so that when the animator moved the arm, it looked like there were internal pieces sort of driving that motion. Probably the most important technology though that we developed inside of the work we did in Maya was the TFM tools. And the animators could move every single piece of geometry on these robots if they wanted to. But a lot of times that wasn't enough. Um, usually what they'd want to do is grab a couple of pieces and move them together. So with the system you could select a bunch of pieces and then say build me a TFM stack. And what that would let us do, it would give us a series of three controllers and they would go and position the controllers where they wanted this geometry to pivot from. So, like here, I put one in the center and one at the top. Then they push a button and they get an animation controller to work with, and now.
now all those the pieces that they selected would move together. And this was really important because if you can imagine like the break discs, they had hundreds of pieces in there and they could just grab them all, make a new stack and basically rig the character uh, per shot. There was no way that we could really anticipate every single way that we'd want to um, do these or create these rigs for the shot. So we tried to put tools in the animator's hands to do it. And here's a great example of where that got used. Um, in the shot, Bumblebee is struggling and his chest hits the ground. Uh, we didn't have to run a simulation or build a custom rig. The animator just went in, gra grabbed all the chest geometry, created the, one of these TFM stacks, and then hand animated the collision. Of course, it takes a really talented animator to you know, make that look good, too. So a third level of, of rigging that we had to add in there were these jiggle notes, and this was based off a plugin that Andrea Maiola wrote for us. And what these allowed us to do was add that sort of secondary jiggle. Um, but what was really important was that we gave the animators full control over that because we didn't want it just to be a sim that was out of their hands. We wanted it to be integrated into the animation performance. So that really helped us sell the weight of uh, the characters when they're running. Additionally, we had to do a lot of smaller sims like these cables, which actually turned out to be fairly complicated. Uh, but they actually are, are set up using my hair, and um, the animator was able to run these two shots uh, themselves. And um, they worked out quite nicely. The transformations were extremely complicated on the rigging front. Um, they really were an engineering process, but you can see how much they are designed to um, work for the camera. Here's a transformation in OH20, which really doesn't make a lot of sense when you look at it from the outside view. But when you see it from the camera, it works really well. And um, it wasn't so much about moving a, a car piece from point A to point B. You know, it wasn't just like, okay, here's the car door and it has to go here. It was really about an animation animation design process and making sure that the most interesting things were happening right in front of camera. So you see the way that things shift in different planes and fold over each other. We wanted to have a real puzzle feel, you know, like a, almost a Rubik's Cube or something like that where it's coming together, make it feel complicated, keep the energy up, you know, because Michael doesn't want anything to be slow or boring. And then, um, you know, really put a lot of time finessing and also make it feel like that robot really came out of that car. So much of these transformers were lit, lit by the reflection paths, which you can see here. And part of the way we made them look so good was by going out and shooting high-res 8K reflection spheres for every single shot they did on the film. So when a TD would start their shot, they could go find this sphere that they would use for reflections and drop the robot in and probably be 60 to 70% of the way right off the bat. We then would often go in and paint in custom little details for reflections or in a case of like uh, the WH sequence which is at night and it's outside the boys' room, we had to paint out because there was Christmas lights everywhere and they were just sparkling like trees. That was, it was quite difficult. So on top of that, here's the specular pass and you can see it picks up these really nice highlights. And um, the compositors would put this great treatment on top of that uh, for all these glints and flares um, that when, when seen by themselves again sort of look like a, you know, something from Las Vegas. But when you see it in the final shot, um, it really does help them feel more like metal. Because when you look at cars out in the real world and there's a bright sunlight on it, it flares out completely. You get these nice glints that run across the metal. So we tried to make sure that we had all that in there. The only things we really ray traced were the glass and some of the pipes, especially when their faces were close to them. Um, we knew we'd be doing building destruction, so I always like to bring along early tests so you can see like, as we develop the process and what it might look like. And of course, with 30 foot tall robots running around a city, you know you're going to be doing footprints. So we had a system designed where we could just lay out NURBS patches and um, generate footprints very quickly. We, we had this cube transformation that was pretty undefined. It's like, well, what is this really? Um, so this was a plug-in that uh, Nigel Sumner wrote using the Maya particle engine. And um, with, with it, he had full animation control over it. So we were able to do um, a lot of different iterations on it very quickly in order to come to something that the director was pretty happy with. Additionally, with uh, Michael Bay film, you get to do a lot of destruction. And there's nothing more fun as a CG artist than doing a lot of destruction every day. So here you see some rigid destruction from uh, Blackout's Blast. For the concussion wave, we would do fluid sims um, to get a lot of the, the cooler effects that went with it. And then we did a lot of particle sims in our proprietary engine for things like sand. And th this is one of my favorite shots in the film. I often say this is how we felt you know, when we'd have our transmissions with the director during the day. <laughs>